Dog me get ritual de la magi. Part I I the ritual of transcendental magic by Eliphas Levi Alphonse Lewis Constant. Translated by A. E. Waite. Originally published by Ryder and Company, England, 1896. Transcribed and converted to a dodiacrobat format by Benjamin Rose, January 2002. Chapter I. Preparations. Every intention which does not assert itself by deeds is a vain intention, and the speech which expresses it is idle speech. It is action which proves life and establishes will. Hence it is said in the sacred and symbolical books that men will be judged, not according to their thoughts and their ideas, but according to their works. We must be in order to be. We have, therefore, to treat in this place of the grand and terrific question of magical works, we are concerned no longer with theories and abstractions, we approach realities, and we are about to place the want of miracles in the hands of the adept, saying to him at the same time, be not satisfied with what we tell you, act for yourself. We have to deal here with works of relative omnipotence, with the means of laying hold upon the greatest secrets of nature and compelling them into the service of an enlightened and inflexible will. Most known magical rituals are either mystifications or enigmas, and we are about to rend for the first time, after so many centuries, the veil of the occult sanctuary. To reveal the holiness of mysteries is to provide a remedy for their profanation. Such is the thought which sustains our courage and enables us to face all the perils of this enterprise, possibly the most dangerous which it has been permitted the human mind to conceive and carry out. Behind the veil of all the hieratratic and mystical allegories of ancient doctrines, behind the darkness and strange ordeals of all initiations, under the seal of all sacred writings, in the ruins of Nineveh or Thebes, on the crumbling stones of old temples and on the blackened visage of the Assyrian or Egyptian Sphinx, in a monstrous or marvelous paintings which interpret to the faithful of India the inspired pages of the Vedas, in the cryptic emblems of our old books on alchemy, in the ceremonies practiced at reception by all secret societies, there are found indications of a doctrine which is everywhere the same and everywhere carefully concealed. Occult philosophy seems to have been the nurse or godmother of all intellectual forces, the key of all divine obscurities and the absolute queen of society in those ages when it was reserved exclusively for the education of priests and of kings. It reigned in Persia with the Magi, who perished in the end, as perish all masters of the world, because they abused their power. It endowed India with the most wonderful traditions and with an incredible wealth of poesy, grace and error in its emblems. It civilized Greece to the music of the lyre of Orpheus. It concealed the dark principles of all sciences, all progress of the human mind, and the daring calculations of Pythagoras, fable abounded in its miracles, and history, attempting to estimate this unknown power, became confused with fable, but undermined or consolidated empires by its oracles, caused tyrants to tremble on their thrones and governed all minds, either by curiosity or by fear. For this science, said the crowd, there is nothing impossible, it commands the elements, knows the language of the stars and directs the planetary courses, when it speaks, the moon falls blood red from heaven, the dead rise in their graves and mutter ominous words, as the night wind blows through their skulls. Mistress of love or of hate? Occult science can dispense paradise or hell at its pleasure to human hearts, it disposes of all forms and confers beauty or ugliness, with the want of certainty it changes men into brutes and animals alternately into men. It disposes even of life and death, can confer wealth on its adepts by the transmutation of metals and immortality by its quintessence or elixir, compounded of gold and light. Such was magic from Zoroaster to Magnes, from Orpheus to Apollonius of Tyana, when positive Christianity, victorious at length over the brilliant dreams and titanic aspirations of the Alexandrian school, dared to launch its anathemas publicly against this philosophy and thus first it to become more occult and mysterious than ever. More. Over, strange and alarming rumors began to circulate concerning initiates or adepts. They were surrounded everywhere by an ominous influence, and they destroyed the war distracted those who allowed themselves to be beguiled by their honeyed eloquence or by the sorcery of their learning. The women whom they loved became street jays and their children vanished at nocturnal meetings while men whispered shudderingly and in secret of blood-stained orgies and abominable banquets. Bones had been found in the crypts of ancient temples, shrieks had been heard in the night, 
harvests withered and herds sickened when the magician passed by. Diseases which defied medical skill appeared at times in the world, and always, it was said, beneath the envenomed glance of the adepts. At length the universal cry of execration went up against magic, the mere name became a crime and the common hatred was formulated in this sentence, magicians to the flames. As it was shouted some centuries earlier, to the lions with the Christians. Now the multitude never conspires except against real powers, it does not know what is true, but it has the instinct of what is strong. It remained for the 18th century to derive both Christian and magic, while infatuated with the disquisitions of Rousseau and the illusions of Cagliostro. Science, notwithstanding, is at the basis of magic, as at the root of Christianity there is love, and in the gospel symbols we find the word incarnate adorned in his cradle. By three magi, led thither by the start triad and the sign of the microcosm and receiving their gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh, a second mysterious triplicity, under which emblem the highest secrets of the Kabbalah are allegorically contained. Christianity owes therefore no hatred to magic, but human ignorance has ever stood in fear of the unknown. The science was driven into hiding to escape the impassioned assaults of blind desire, it clothed itself with new hieroglyphics, falsified its intentions, denied its hopes. Then it was that the jargon of alchemy was created, an impenetrable illusion for the vulgar in their greed of gold, the living language only for the true disciple of Hermes. Extraordinary Fact Among the sacred records of the Christians there are two texts which the infallible Church makes no claim to understand and has never attempted to expound. These are the prophecy of Ezekiel and the Apocalypse, two Kabbalistic keys reserved assuredly in heaven for the commentaries of Magian kings, books sealed as with seven seals for faithful believers, yet perfectly plain to an initiated infidel of the occult sciences. One there is also another work, but, although it is popular in a sense and may be found everywhere, this is of all most occult and unknown, because it is the key of the rest. It is in public evidence without being known to the public, no one suspects its existence and no one dreams of seeking it where it actually is. This book, which may be older than that of Enoch, has never been translated, but is still preserved unmutilated in primeval characters, on detached leaves, like the tablets of the ancients. The fact has eluded notice, though a distinguished scholar has revealed, not indeed its secret, but its antiquity and singular preservation. Another scholar, but of a mind more fantastic than judicious, passed thirty years in the study of this masterpiece, and has merely suspected its plenary importance. It is, in truth, a monumental and extraordinary work, strong and simple as the architecture of the pyramids, and consequently enduring. One according to his posthumous work, Le Mysteries de la Cabal, page 24i, Levi not only regarded the Apocalypse as a key to the Kabbalah but as a symbolical epitome of the science of initiates. Like those a book which is the summary of all sciences, which can resolve all problems by its infinite combinations, which speaks by evoking thought is the inspirer and moderator of all possible conceptions, and the masterpiece perhaps of the human mind. One it is to be counted unquestionably among the very great gifts bequeathed to us by antiquity, it is a universal key, the name of which has been explained and comprehended only by the learned William Postel, it is a unique test, whereof the initial characters alone plunged into ecstasy the devout spirit of Saint Martin to and might have restored reason to the sublime and unfortunate Swedenborg. We shall recur to this book later on, for its mathematical and precise explanation will be the complement and crown of our conscientious undertaking. The original alliance between Christianity and the science of the Magi, once demonstrated fully, will be a discovery of no secondary importance, and we do not doubt that the serious study of magic and the Kabbalah will lead earnest minds to a reconciliation of science and dogma, of reason and faith, heretofore regarded as impossible.